Thanks everyone for coming. Very excited for today's Sarah Bag. So many of you know Ingrid, she's part of the National Growth and Health Study team here at NCI. And she graduated in UC Berkeley in 2016 with her degree in molecular environmental biology. And she's going to be sharing with us today some of all of the work that she was doing prior to coming to NCI and her work in the Urban Bee Lab. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Yeah. It's nice to see everybody. I know working in NGHS, I haven't, I haven't formally met everybody here. Um, so I'm really happy to be able to see everyone and show what I know about bees. Um, but I'll get started. Let's see. Um, yeah, so I worked um, at UC Berkeley with uh, an ecology lab working with native bees um, under Dr. Gordon Frankie, who's a professor in the ethical department, environmental science, policy and management. And he runs this lab called the Urban Bee Lab. And I was a part of it during my undergrad. It was a really great um, like research opportunity for me during my undergrad, and I learned so much. Um, I've always been interested in health sciences, but also passionate about uh, conservation and environmental science. So it was a really great opportunity for me. And like I said, I truly learned so much. And I'm happy to share what I learned with you guys. Um, so we had a project called Farming for Native Bees. Um, native bees are different from honeybees, and I'll go into that in a moment. But we studied bees in wild, urban, and agricultural settings, um, and how they all relate, how we can increase the diversity in all of these areas. Um, so I'll get started. Um, so I'm going to go over general characteristics of native bees. Um, Shelley talks the question, what's the difference between a bee and a fly? What, what makes them? Uh, different and how can it really different. So I'll go over that. Um, we had some early bee work in the early 2000s studying the relationship between um, plants and bees. And um, right here at the UC Berkeley Oxford Tract, um, it's on like, just north of Hearst Street. There we had our bee garden there. Um, and we implemented a habitat garden for bees there. And we studied how implementing this garden, how did it increase bee diversity. Um, and then we were able to apply this knowledge of the bee plant relationships that we learned about to the agricultural setting um, in forms um, and also in other cities as well, other urban settings. Um, so I will go over all of that. But first off, I wanted to test you guys. And looking at this picture, I wanted you guys to think uh, in your head, pick out all of the all of the bees that you see here. Which one of these? Uh, insects are bees. So I'll give you a couple seconds, <laughs> 15 seconds to kind of get that in your head and then I will reveal the answer. So uh, all of the box uh, insects are bees and they look really different. Um, these have a really wide variety of size, colors, and um, and have an overall general shape to them, but they can look really different, and they all have their own different behaviors. Uh, so the one top left is a fly, um, and then all of these other guys are bees. That's a grasshopper there, and I'm pretty sure that's a type of, I'm not sure on seeing what that insect is in the bottom middle, but the rest are bees. And we have our honeybee right here in the bottom left. Um, the rest are native. So I wanted to give a side-by-side -side picture of a bee on the right and a fly on the left. Um, they can look pretty similar, and definitely they flies sometimes try to mimic bees because bees do have stingers, and um, the flies like to, to mimic that. Um, and the key characteristics between flies and bees, I would say, are the main thing is their eyes. Looking at the fly, I can immediately tell that it is a fly because they have those big round eyes on the sides of the head. Um, bee eyes are a lot more slender. Um, also, their legs, it doesn't show up as well in this picture, but the fly legs are a lot more thin and they tend to rub their legs together. They have kind of typical fly behaviors that once you start looking at them and try, uh, uh, once you start paying attention to them, they have very different behaviors. Um, and thirdly, I was explaining to Shelly, um, Bee wings have, uh, bees have two sets of wings, whereas flies only have one set of wings. Um, so just, that's hard to tell looking with your naked eye, but under a microscope that helps taxonomists identify um, 
these from slides. Um, and so going over native bees, um, there are, or just bees in general, there are 20,000 different species of bees in the world. Um, and just in North America, there are 4,000 different species of bees. Here in California, we have 1,600 different bees. And I wanted to ask you guys why you think there might be such a large percentage of the nation's bee diversity here in California. And like, yes, I think they might know why California is yes, yeah, a very diverse ecosystem. Exactly. Exactly. It's spot on. California has so many different types of landscapes, um, chaparrales, coastal regions, mountains. So really, California um, has such a diverse amount of different flower and plant species that have co-evolved with native bees over time. So they, without native bees, we don't have native plants. Um, and without plants, we don't have the bees. So they're really codependent upon one another. And here's just a depiction of how important um, having a diverse array of flower and plant species, um, how important that is for bees. And so bee pollination, bees are super important for a variety of reasons, um, for the intrinsic value of uh, conserving wildlife, for uh, the aesthetic value of having all these beautiful flowers around. Um, agricultural purposes, bees are really important um, to provide that ecosystem, ecosystem service for us. And, um, but beyond that, they're also, there's a huge economic value in bees. So if somebody doesn't see the importance of conserving bees for environmental purposes, for uh, aesthetic purposes, um, we can really make that economic argument that bees are uh, such an important part of our agricultural industry. Um, so in the U.S., about 100 uh, crops in the U.S. and Canada, 100 crops are pollinated by bees. Um, and about 30% of our daily diet um, comes from bee pollinated crops. Without bees, we wouldn't have access to our favorite fruits, vegetables, and nuts. Um, so some bee-pollinated uh, bee crops are listed here, like almonds, berries, uh, members of the squash family, the cucurbitaceae family, uh, cucumbers, squash, watermelon. Um, they have a specific bee called, uh, nicknamed the squash bee. Uh, its genus is Pessimasis, but um, that particular bee is really important specifically for squash flowers, members of the squash family. Um, so the economic value of honeybees is $20 billion a year in the U.S. And of native bees, it is three, about $3 billion a year. So they're incredibly important. Um, and I'll go into the difference between honeybees and native bees. Um, it will seem good. Do you mind questions? Of course. So how is that calculated? I think there's different. I took those figures from a couple of our papers that we published through the lab. but I think just going towards um, looking at the, the crops that are dependent upon bees that are bee pollinated and looking at how much those are how much those are selling and so be, those those crops there are um, solely pollinated by bees for the most part there are other pollinators like wasps flies um, wind pollination as well but uh, those other pollinators that I listed aren't as uh, efficient at pollinating as bees are. Um, there, some of these plants, like almonds up here, are solely dependent actually on honeybee pollination. I'm not sure exactly why, but it's just that it's, I think due to the cross-pollination of it, they, the wind doesn't, wind pollination doesn't uh, do the same, accomplish the same job. Um, yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure exactly how those numbers are calculated, but um, I can refer you to the paper. Yeah, so, uh, so native bees. I brought up honeybees here, and why is this lab that I worked in, why is it focusing so heavily on native bees? Um, so honeybees, I'll give a little background. Honeybees are actually not native to the U.S. Um, they came over from Europe, from around the Mediterranean area in the 1600s when um, this land was being colonized. Um, and so they were brought over, and they're not native to the U.S. Um, but they became such a important part of our agricultural system because of the fact that honeybees can be domesticated. They live in these hives that um, can be transported around the country to different farms. 
Um, so that makes it really easy for us to, uh, to pollinate our crops. Native bees, on the other hand, are wild. Um, they don't live in hives, they don't live in colonies. They make their nests either under the ground or um, in, in cavities, oftentimes in trees. Um, so there's no way for us to transport these around the country. And that's why we have such, we're so dependent on honeybees because it was very convenient for us to, to utilize them. Um, but the issue is we have become fully dependent on this one species of bee. Honeybees are just one species out of the 20,000 different uh, species in the world. Um, and we have all of our eggs in this one basket. So if something were to happen to honeybees, um, which something is happening called colony collapse disorder, um, we are doomed basically because we need species for, um, for our food. Um, so this lab and a lot of different research labs are now focusing on native bees as an alternative. Um, native bees can pollinate just as efficiently um, and supplement some of the pollination. It's just that we have not encouraged uh, native bee diversity. We do not plant resources for them. Um, farms oftentimes don't have any sort of cover cropping or they build, uh, they plant huge monocultures of just one specific type of crop which doesn't sustain native bee growth and honeybee uh, diversity or abundance for that matter. Um, so that is what is so special about native bees. Um, and they're this special little alternative, special uh, resource, and they're very precious. Um, and so native bees, like I said, honeybees are just one species of bee. But native bees, there are so many different types. Every native bee has its own story. Um, there are so many different sizes of bees, colors, uh, different bee behaviors. Um, and that allows a lot of opportunity for new research to occur. Um, per bee uh, species. And so here are some images. Some of them are similar to the ones that you see on the table, but uh, these are all different types of bees. So I'll start with the top left. Um, the top left, Agapacum and Texanus, is the ultra green sweat bee. Um, all of these bees, we've tried to give common names to them to make them more familiar to the community because uh, for the most part, I think this what I was familiar with before I started um, in the Urban Labs was just honeybees. Um, I didn't know the common names, maybe the bumblebee, but uh, we're really trying to increase uh, community awareness about all the different types of bees. Um, so the ultra green sweat bee is in the top left, and why do you think it might be called a sweat bee? Anyone knows? But it's not just okay. <laughs> Christy! <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it's because they like to land on people who are sweating and they like to eat sweat, right? Mm -hmm. They get nutrients from what you sweat out. Exactly. They get minerals. So they won't, they don't bite you in any way. They'll just lap up the sweat. So if you ever have something, you might think it's a fly that has landed on you, um, but it might in case be a bee. It's never happened to me, but that's why they have their, their common name. <laughs> um, and ultra green, because this type of sweat bee happens to be ultra green. <laughs> Um, and then right here is the, uh, in the top right, the uh, summer longhorn bee. It's called the summer longhorn bee because it comes out in the summer and it has long horns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, bottom left is the uh, mask bee, Hylaeus. Um, called that because it looks like it's wearing a mask. Um, and Hylaeus is about the size of a grain of rice, so it's pretty small. Um, and it can be really difficult to see unless you're looking really up close to different flowers. Oftentimes I wouldn't know it was a Hylaeus bee and not apply it until I caught it with a net and looked at it up close. So it can be really hard to spot. And then the bottom, the bottom right is the Mega Kylie bee, um, also known as the leaf cutter bee. It uses, uh, it cuts out with its mandibles um, chunks of leaf. It cuts leaf to make its nest. Um, so that's where it gets its name. Um, and all of these bees, again, different sizes, different colors. Um, they also carry pollen in different ways. So bees have something called uh, gopha, uh, which are little hairs, um, either on their legs or on their bellies. Um, you'll see here the summer longhorn bee in the top right is carrying some pollen on the scope on its legs. But uh, leaf cutter bees in the bottom left like to carry it on their bellies. They have different pollen collection behaviors. Some bees uh, will use their legs to rub against the pollen. Um, the Mega Kylie bee likes uh, 
flowers that kind of have a big landing pad of pollen, so things like uh, part of the sunflower family, where they can truly land on the pollen and kind of bang their bellies <laughs> up and down on the pollen. Uh, we have some more bees. The carpenter bee in the top right, you might have, or top left, you might have seen this one around Berkeley. They kind of look like beetles sometimes. They're very big and they make a loud buzzing noise. Um, but they're gentle giants, they move very slowly. Um, and this is a perfect depiction of how um, plants have co-evolved with bees. So you can see that the, the stamens from the flower are depositing the pollen directly upon the bee's back um, as the bee is foraging for nectar. That's the way that uh, the flower is providing the bee with nectar, a food source, and also um, increasing pollination of the time. Uh, I'm honestly not sure what type of bee this trapusa is. I'm not familiar with that one, but the bottom right is another type of sweat bee, um, a different genus though. And then bottom right, Andrina, also known as the mining bee. They're called the mining bee because they like to build their nests underground and mine into the ground. Um, so yeah, I've touched lightly on the different, how, uh, on the different ways native bees nest. Um, so, most native bees are solitary, like I said. They don't form any uh, type of colony, um, and 70% of native bees nest underground, and 30% of native bees uh, find cavities, either preformed cavities or uh, carpenter bees are known to drill their own holes because they're bigger and they have um, bigger mandibles and more power to drill their own holes. Um, and the fact that 70% of bees are ground nesters has big implications for gardeners. I know um, mulching is a popular gardening practice because it does serve benefits in terms of uh, eliminating uh, water evaporation and um, has aesthetic value. But uh, because most bees are, or most 70% of native bees are ground nesting, it's important if you want to encourage um, bees in your garden to have. Uh, empty spots of soil that are bare without any mulch on them um, to give them that opportunity to nest. But can you tell if it's like looking in your yard if you have ground um, ground dwelling nests? Mm -hmm. um, so I noticed I, there, you can see the holes sometimes, but it's hard to tell whether or not it's a hole made by another insect or um, a bee. However, uh, if you, it might be kind of difficult. You don't want to be sitting in your garden and staring at the, at the dirt. But I've seen uh, bees come out of the ground. Um, and once you find a spot, um, oftentimes what we would do is put a vial over the hole and we would see bees come out of it to see what type of bee it was. Um, so it is possible, but it, it might be a little bit tedious. Can I one more question? So how do they lap up the sweat? Do they have a proboscis? Mm -hmm. They do, exactly. They have a little tongue up the bottom. <laughs> that's how they also get the nectar from flowers. Yes, so solitary nesters have solitary. So solitary meaning that they don't live in a community. Um, so unlike honeybees, um, they're not, they don't have a, a colony that they're contributing back to. It'll just be a mother bee. She has a, a mating incident somewhere <laughs> in the world and then we'll make her nest and just, um, develop the nest for her future offspring. Um, and it'll just be her in there. And she'll lay her eggs. And then once, that, once the nest is positioned, she will leave, um, carry out the rest of her life, and die a couple. <laughs> she provides pollen and nectar for them within the nest. And from there, she's, she's gone. <laughs> Any other questions for me? Yeah, it's not super relevant to this, but it's, I was thinking now with the colony, why is it that honeybees have a colony? What's like, what's the benefit for them of having one? I'm not sure exactly why, but there are behaviors that have evolved around that. Um, so you might have heard that bees die immediately after they sting you, um, so they can only sting once. Um, and that's only true for honeybees. And it makes sense for honeybees because they live in this, this colony where there's so many other members that they would want to protect. It's almost like they're sacrificing themselves for the greater good of the colony. But with solitary bees, they don't have that behavior. They can sing multiple times. They don't die after they sing you because there would be no purpose to 
could act if they were there's no it wouldn't be serving any greater good for them to do so. So that's a good question. Um only female bees have stingers actually. Um so male bees they bees tend to have um sexual dimorphism so you can tell what is a male versus a female without having to look under a microscope. So if you see a male bee, you can, there'll be a picture, you can really grab it in midair and it, it can't do anything to you. Um, you can look more closely at, at what's going on. Um, but the, the stinger evolved with the ovipositor, which is the um, egg laying apparatus for the bees. So only female bees have stingers. Does that make sense? Are they protecting themselves? Not really. <laughs> they they can have aggressive behavior will where they will bonk into other bees, but um nothing they, they don't have a stinger. I, I guess they have mandibles, but I don't they're not known to bite. That isn't interesting. Yeah. Do they make honey from native bees? So uh that's also a good question. Honeybees are really the only bees that make honey. Um, bumblebees are a type of native bee that actually they do live in colonies. They live together. Um, so that's that's one of the few native species that have a, a, a social behavior. Um, and bumblebees do make a secretion similar to honey, but it doesn't taste like honey in any way. It's it's produced from pollen and nectar as well, and just goes through their their system um, and is excreted. But it it does it wouldn't taste like the honey. Y'all know. Mm -hmm. There aren't any other questions, but please, I love the question. Please feel free to ask. So I mentioned 70% uh, are ground nesters, um, and then the other 30% will make their nests in cavities. So uh, those car carpenter bees will, like I said, um, drill their holes themselves. So oftentimes, People think of if you have a wooden house or any type of wooden awning, people oftentimes think of carpenter bees as pets because they're they're wanting to make their home inside of your house. Um, but uh, setting up wooden logs um, near your house can be a uh, a way to get around that um, without having to use pesticides or something like that to get rid of them. Um, but aside from carpenter bees, most other bees uh, will make their nests in pre-drilled holes, um, pre-formed holes from nature, uh, in pits and stems. Um, and we did a study uh, setting out these top nest blocks, um, which you can easily do. You just drill holes into pieces of wood. Um, and we did a study to see, we set these out on farms in Brentwood to see what would be inhabiting them. And here's an image showing um, some of the fills that we had. So you can see the green, uh, the green blocks are filled with leaf. So those are leaf cutter bees that are making their nest in there. Um, and then some of them are uh, covered in mud. Those are uh, osmia, which are also known as uh, mason bees because they like to make their nests out of mud. Um, and then you see in the bottom left, there, it looks like there's two little eyes. I believe that that is a female bee provisioning her nest, but I'm not 100% sure. That could just be a blurry image. <laughs> Um, and here is the image of a male uh, carpenter bee. Um, it's female, uh, the female version of this bee is the big black uh, bee that you see in these boxes and that we saw earlier um, getting the pollen deposited onto its back from that purple flower. Um, so this is a really clear case of how different male and female bees can look of the same species. Um, and we like to call this bee the teddy bear bee because it's pretty fuzzy and it has this golden brown color. Um, and and yeah, that that uh, that is our project manager of the lab holding the bee. So we took that picture just a few years ago. Uh, and so I talked about colony collapse disorder, how um, uh, with colony collapse disorder honeybee hives are uh, are collapsing virtually. Um, there, there have been reports since 2000, 2006 of about 35% of colonies um, being wiped out uh, uh, annually, and even up to 90% reported by some beekeepers. So it's uh, a big problem. Um, it's not just here in the US, international, and 
Asia, Europe, Central America, they're also reporting similar findings of this colony collapse disorder. Um, and the cause of it isn't 100% uh, clear. It could be, it's a mixture of um, pesticide use, um, habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, the use of huge monocultures where farmers are just planting one species of plant and that's not a diverse enough diet for these bees. Um, bees need to have uh, a diverse, a diverse diet in order to build up their immunity and be able to ward off pathogens and viruses. So viruses are also another cause, uh, potential cause of colony collapse disorder. Um, and native bees are not uh, are not immune to these to these uh, issues. Um, it's just that the fact that they don't live in a colony, they don't live in a hive, they're not facing the same um, the same wipeout that uh, having these honeybees all in one concentrated area. Um, they're not facing the same collapse disorder as uh, honeybees are. But it is still important to still uh, not use pesticides, uh, increase uh, diversity in terms of for resources for all types of bees. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the benefit of having just one crop? Why would farmers do that rather than? I I think it's because it's efficient. Each type of crop has its own, own uh, management needs. So having one type of crop is really, uh, can be more efficient. And, uh, but there, there really uh, is great benefit in terms of providing habitat gardens, having a diverse amount of crops, but farmers oftentimes don't see that advantage. They just see it as requiring more money and more management, and they don't see the long-term payoff that it will have in terms of increasing the pollen and their diversity. Um, and that was one of our last uh, goals to increase outreach and work with farmers to really help them understand. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can really answer this question, but whenever you're driving by large swaths of vineyards, there's mm -hmm. all these different plants at the end of each of the rows of grapes. Mm -hmm. You know if that has something to do with it, like increasing diversity so that like bees colonize, or if they're not colonized, mm -hmm. um, pollinate the flowers and the grapes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. That's one of our. That's one of the things we did. We tried to implement habitat uh, along alongside the crops to so cover cropping. Um, those could be efforts by the farmer to try and increase the floral resources for the bees that are pollinating their crops. Definitely. So um, this is here, just um, the, at the Oxford track here at UC Berkeley. They're currently trying to turn that into, I think. Um, student living space, so another dorm, which is terrible because it's such a great uh, research, uh, it's a spot of land for agricultural research, um, and it's got to be one of the But um, we started a project um, in the early 2000s, the Urban Bee Lab started a project in the early 2000s um, to study the relationship between certain bees, uh, or certain plants and bees. Um, and before the garden was, uh, was created, we, surveyed nine different species of bees in Berkeley. And then, so let's this is what it looked like before. In Berkeley, there were nine different species um, of bee that had been found in Berkeley. Um, and then in 2008, the garden looked like this. So five years later, we had surveyed up to 90 species of bee. Um, so just showing how uh, providing floral resources for bees has a really big impact on Bee diversity and the fact that urban areas can sustain um, high levels of bee diversity just as just as much as wildland areas and uh, agricultural areas as long as there's there's habitat um, for them. Uh, so, like I said, the goal was to study um, the relationship between uh, bees and flowers. So, what flowers are most attractive to certain bees? Um, how can we best manage these uh, different flowers? Um, and uh, doing this project in Berkeley, how can we implement this in uh, gardens all over the state in different cities? So we found that certain plant families were very highly attractive to bees, um, in the aster family, rose family, uh, and below here are a couple of different species of Cecilia, which are one of um, Cecilia is a great plant genus for bees. It's very highly attractive. And again, you can see the stamens of the, on the left, the stamens of the Cecilia um, 
directly depositing the pollen on that uh, on that mason bee's abdomen. Um, so again, just the co-evolution between bee behavior and um, or bee morphology and plant morphology. And it was also found that native bees uh, like to forage uh, more often on native plants than non-native plants. Um, but that's not to say that native, non-native plants aren't good for bees. They are still attractive. They provide the same uh, pollen and nectar resources that native plants, um, that native plants provide. Uh, and I recently uh, worked with uh, other lab members to co-author a paper on the attractiveness of native versus non-native plants. And we, looking at this research from these urban findings, um, we really found that planting both native and non-native uh, plants um, is overall better than just planting strictly native or strictly non-native. I know a lot of the times California gardeners tend to think that having purely native gardens is best practice because native plants have so many benefits. They've, they've evolved to, to thrive in our California climate. They're oftentimes drought tolerant, drought resistant, um, and a lot of bees really do like them. But incorporating non-native plants will have a beneficial effect. Uh, having both, uh, so native plants tend to bloom earlier in the year, and non-native plants tend to bloom later in the year. So having uh, both native and non-native plants increases uh, floral bloom throughout the year, which really uh, not only increases the abundance, but the diversity, because different bees are active at different times of the year. So having a garden that can bloom all year round is really great for bees. And yeah, some of these plants listed here are lavenders, sages, uh, salvia is the uh, Latin name for sage, um, vitex, uh, meteta, which is like a catmint or uh, catmint. Um, those are all examples of non-native plants that are really great for bees. And just again, we incorporated uh, what we learned from the Berkeley Bee Garden to cities all over California. Um, so these are examples of some of the gardens that we would monitor. So Hume, Yokohama, and Sacramento. And we would uh, monitor these gardens um, using aerial netting practices. So really catching a bee with a net and um, putting it into a vial, which was really fun. It was I really enjoyed being outside and working in this lab and just really getting to be amongst all the beautiful flowers and catching bees. Um, and we really found high levels of bee, bee diversity in all of these cities that had these gardens already implemented. So just again to show that urban areas can really act as um, reservoirs for, for bees and provide resources. Uh, so along with uh, aerial netting, another monitoring, monitoring uh, method is to do frequency counts. And this is how you can see how attractive a certain plant is to um, a certain bee. So really, you, you pop yourself in front, in front of a three meter by three meter uh, chunk of plant, and you just watch all of the bees that come in, and you record what you're seeing. It's hard to, uh, to tell exactly what species uh, you're seeing because it can be hard to see with the naked eye, um, differentiating species by species. But once you start to spend more time around bees, you can you can start to tell at least identify it to genus level um, just using your naked eye. Yeah, and this is cherry blossom. <laughs> uh, and then lastly, there's one slide for it, but pan trapping was another collection method. So just setting out bowls of uh, uh, soapy water, soupy water, all the soapy water and the shininess attracts the bee and will we'll trap it. Um, and that's a really uh, standardized method of, of blocking bees. Uh, so from this urban project, we were able to learn about bee flower relationships. So we found native plants oftentimes are very attractive for native bees. Poppies are a great California native plant. Um, that are attractive to many different types of bees, particularly the yellow-faced bumblebee, and uh, that's a type of sweat bee. <laughs> there are many types of sweat bees. Um, also studying that xylocopa is very, the carpenter bee is very 
um, king, king for the listeria flower, um, honeybees actually aren't really able to forage from this plant. Um, it might be because they're, they don't have uh, familiarity with, with the plant because I'm actually not sure if listeria is native or a non-native plant, but um, certain bees prefer certain plants and honeybees tend to not prefer listeria, but from the bees like them. Um, and Cecilia, this uh, tansy Cecilia is the common name for it. Um, Cecilia tanacetifolia is an amazing bee plant. Um, it attracts over 60 bee species, um, and it has very conspicuous um, blue, bright blue pollen. So it's really neat anytime you see a bee that has that bright blue pollen on its scopa, on its uh, abdomen or leg. Um, it's really neat to see. Uh, this flower tends to bloom early April here in Northern California. And um, I will say, if you if you do want to plant with this flower, use gloves because they have little spiky, uh, spiky hairs. So uh, with all this urban knowledge, uh, studying the relationship between certain bee plants and bees, um, we were invited, the Urban Bee Lab was uh, invited to start an agricultural project and apply this knowledge of um, implementing bee habitat in agricultural settings. Um, so this took place in Brentwood, California, um, just 45 minutes east, and uh, we we had a had a grant to construct habitat um, on the farm to supplement honeybee pollination. Always with the goal to supplement honeybee pollination and monitor these populations over time and seeing how if we implement bee habitat on one farm. Um, how does that increase the bee diversity that we see in that location? Um, and also outreach was always a really big part of our lab to make sure that we're interacting with the community to, uh, to spread the knowledge that we've learned. <laughs> um, so this is here, uh, this is on Frog Hollow Farm, that's Mount Diablo in the back. Um, and just a beautiful cherry orchard. Uh, it was really nice to walk through, very therapeutic. Um, and then also just to show, so the, these are the cherry or orchards, the cherry flowers blossoms that we were looking at, and we we're trying to see what these species were going to the cherry orchards, um, and what uh, plants can we implement um, that these particular cherry bees, uh, what do these cherry bees also like to eat? What other plants can we plant to increase their diversity? Um, but we also found that weedy flowers are great for bees. Bees love, uh, Mustard and, and dandelion, sonchus, um, this is a sonchus flower and a sweat bee uh, foraging for the pollen. So, a lot of farming practices, uh, they like to keep their, uh, their, their farm completely clean, no weeds, uh, lots of herbicides, but weeds really do have a benefit, a benefit for, for bees. Uh, so we were invited in 2009, I think, to begin this research um, on farms. And by 2012, uh, we had eight farms that we were working with. So we had two <coughs> treatment farms where we were implementing the bee habitat, bee gardens on the farm. And we had four control farms um, where we didn't do anything. Uh, and we studied, we monitored their bee population over the next few years. Uh, this is a layout of the, the farms that we were working with. Uh, Dwelly, Brookside, uh, Frog Hollow, um, Wolf, Wolf, Tequila, and Minos. And you can see that there is a diverse, uh, there's diverse landscape in Brentwood. Some of the farms are directly adjacent to this wildland area um, in the, the hills and mountains, closer to Mount Diablo. And um, Dwelly Farms tended to, uh, Dwelly Farms was, uh, more in an urban area, so it had more of an urban setting. And we saw that these variables really came into play um, just, uh, when we were seeing what types of, uh, or seeing the different levels of bee diversity at these different farms. This is Farmer Al in the bottom right. Uh, he's the owner of Frog Hollow. He's very nice, he's always really willing to work with us, um, and he cares about the bees, but one problem that he has is that he just forgets to maintain the garden. So that's a big uh, building relationship with, with farmers. Uh, there's a huge variable seeing um, whether or not these gardens were going to thrive and whether or not um, installing gardens would make a lasting impact on bees. Um, so drilling uh, into, drilling the, 
the concept of having these uh, gardens and maintaining them. Um, it takes more than just caring that you actually have to be on top of it and maintain them in order to make glasses as possible. Um, and you can see, so within his orchards, he did a lot of cover crossing, um, which he helped him uh, implement. And then also we had different rows of uh, different bee friendly plants. So this is right in the bottom left, that's the Vitex row. Um, and we planted a lot of different uh, lavenders and, and Vitex along this row. Aim to get a certain percentage of like the ground cover the flowers and pollinators for the bees and with a proportional for the different sizes of the farm. Mm -hmm. So Frog Hollow was a really big farm and it did have areas where we had more areas where we could build our garden. Um, we didn't do it based off of percentages, but we found that it was building this relationship and seeing what a farmer was willing uh, to let us use. Um, that was one of the challenges that we found and really um, acted as a limitation um, in terms of collecting standardized data um, because Farmers oftentimes changed their minds. They said, oh, I originally said you could have this plot of land, but taking it back. So working with farmers, and uh, that was definitely a confounding variable um, and hard to standardize. Um, Jelly Farms had uh, berry crops. That's what they tend to grow. Um, and we implemented uh, lilac flowers, lavenders along the berry, berry vine. Um, and we found this little bee right here, Serotina, um, also known as the small carpenter bee because it's related to that larger carpenter bee. Um, this guy is a really great pollinator for, for berries. Um, and so we studied uh, what types of plants, what type of uh, ornamental plants um, that he also likes to visit so that he or she <laughs> likes to visit so that we could um, increase their numbers and help Dwelly's uh, berry flower pollination. How close do these um, bee-friendly flowers have to be to the crops for it to make a difference? Is it, you know, within a certain radius or do they need to be kind of in the intermediate area? I think that's something that can be studied in, in the future. Um, bees have the ability to fly up to two miles on average away from their nest. So really, um, having, even if there are urban gardens a mile away, those can still act as a, as a reserve for, for bees. Um, and we planted our bee friendly plants right along the sides, directly adjacent, um, or if the farm was large enough, we have them kind of on all four corners of the farm. Um, but that's not, uh, that would be something that would be interesting to study to see if the radius of that affects the numbers. So these are some of our results. I've labeled the control versus treatment farm um, below. And this is showing the number of bee species that these farms, these different farms uh, uh, had over the, the, the six years that we worked there. Um, and you'll see that uh, two of our most uh, bee diverse farms were actually control farms. Um, so that was a really interesting finding for us because we thought in planning, implementing treatment uh, onto these bee friendly habitats onto these farms would definitely increase bee diversity over the control farm. Um, but there are a lot of different variables that came into play. Um, some of the farms, uh, even though they weren't our treatment farms, liked what we were doing and started to implement their own bee habitat. So technically that wasn't our treatment, but um, it just goes to show how important um, developing relationships with farmers and getting the word out, um, how much of an impact that can make. Um, also, Wolf and Brookside, which are control farms, they happen to be directly adjacent to a wildland area. Um, and that's huge because that's, uh, that kind of showed us that, uh, that bees are moving, um, moving around. They're not staying just on the farm, but they're coming in from the wildland areas, from the urban areas, and out as well. So they're foraging for resources all around and not staying directly on the farm. Um, so, right, where do the bees come from? So like I said, from the wildland areas, um, some of the farms were closer to uh, these hills where there were a lot of natural um, bee habitat for, for them. 
urban areas for gardens for planting. These are in, in Celia, I believe. Um, urban areas also make a huge impact and can act as a reservoir and sustain biodiversity just as much as agricultural areas. And then this is that wildland area that I was talking about. Um, we found that we saw a high level of mason bees at this particular farm that was adjacent to this uh, to this wildland area, and it makes sense because mason bees um, are looking for mud to make their nests, and the mud from the creek, uh, I think, was uh, contributing to the higher uh, osmia level. And so, 80 different types of bee plants were used on our different treatment uh, sites. And in Brentwood, we attracted 146 different species of bee um, by the end of 2017. That was our final number. Um, and we were looking at the main bee groups that were moving between ornamental bee plants and crops. So we found bumblebees are a great, uh, great uh, bee to uh, encourage on agricultural settings because they contribute greatly to apple, berry, um, cherry pollination, and um, you can plant the attractive plants to encourage plant growth. Similarly, small carpenter bees, but bees, mining bees, and bigger bees. And so we we learned, and I particularly learned um, during my time with the lab, um, how to manage different bee plants in agricultural systems uh, or agricultural settings. Uh, each plant is really different and requires some gardening uh, management practices. Um, in learning uh, what what they all need. Um, bee plants are sustaining native bee populations, but also honeybee populations. So keeping in mind that the goal is always to supplement honeybee pollination, but not eliminate honeybee from our agricultural uh, practice. Um, merging bee ecology and farm ecology, so really learning from farmers and uh, it's really an exchange of knowledge. We're teaching them about the ecology, but they're sharing so much about how they run their farm. Um, and outreach, again, is super important. That's Farmer Allen at the bottom, and he was always really, really interested in, in what type of bees his farm was, was uh, hosting. Um, and again, that with the trap nest work, we were setting out these bee condos um, for bee, as an additional nesting uh, resource for bees. These need floral uh, resources as well as nesting resources. Um, and yeah, conclusions. Uh, we can attract diverse native bees to constructive habitats in both urban and agricultural settings. Um, we can synchronize the flowering of crop plants with flowering bee plants. Um, so planting, uh, planting cecilias, um, which are in bloom at the same time as berry plants, um, planting them planting both Cecilia and cherries together to really um, foster uh, berry pollination. Um, we can attract native bees to crop flowers, um, and we can encourage uh, target native bee species with floral and nesting resources. So it's important to, to develop those resources in, in our gardens and on our farms um, and in our cities. Uh, we have this this project called the Pollinator Habitat Advisor Project, and kind of creating this idea that maybe there should be a career or a position um, of a pollinator habitat advisor merging uh, or bridging the gap between pharmacology and bee ecology and having this person maintain the gardens that uh, farmers maybe want to have, um, but just don't have the time, resources, and energy to maintain. Uh, studying the economic value of, of of these um, and presenting that because not all people uh, care about the intrinsic value of conserving our bees, but from uh, making the argument that it's, it's not just uh, environmental, it's, it's our food, it's agricultural, it's economical, um, it has implications for public health even, and I'm gonna tie that back. Um, and yeah, I'll bring it back to, to public health uh, with, if we don't have our favorite, uh, Without bees, we won't have our favorite fruit, vegetables, um, nuts, and it'll be a lot more limited, and prices will go up, and it, it just really does affect food security. One of the many uh, indirect uh, relationships uh, between bees and public health. Um, and I was looking, I think, uh, Danny referred me to the article by Laura Burkle, um, and she uh, wrote a paper um, 
using all of this background that I just described um, to make the argument about uh, how important these are for food security and really talking and working with farmers to convey this um, and how conserving these has implications very vast and very, very important. <laughs> uh, and that's everything. I included this bee at the end. This is a type of bumblebee, and I really think this is the cutest that Bombus Melanocutus have ever looked. Um, super cute. And that's our lab, healthybee.org is the Urban Bee Lab website. So if you ever curious, lots of resources there for you to check out. That's everything. Please ask questions. I know I just talked for a very long time. <laughs> what do they do in the winter they are nesting. There are some bees that are active in the winter time. Honeybees are typically active year round. Um, but yeah, certain species are active um, and the ones that are not are uh, nesting. Those maybe the, the females were active earlier in the year in the springtime. And uh, around summer, they will uh, lay their eggs um, and the eggs will continue to develop over the rest of the year. The female will die maybe in late summer, but the eggs will live on and develop over the course of the year. In the following spring, they'll emerge and the cycle will continue. What's the lifespan of a bee? It's about a few months. Uh, it, it differs uh, amongst different species, but about a few months is typical. So does NRCS provide resources for farmers in terms of like, financial resources to help them buy the crops to the person at their farms yet? Or is this kind of an evaluation project to kind of inform? Exactly, exactly. Um, and especially with our new administration, there's not very many, uh, there's not much funding for this. Um, but we're still applying for grants. We're still, that lab is still applying for grants and um, a lot of uh, has a lot of private donations and uh, smaller grants that, are, that it's getting. Um, the Brentwood project has ended, but it's uh, continuing, they're continuing their research in right now on avocado farms. Cool. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the industry adopting this? So a lot of your intervention farms, I think the farms seem like they were small family farms. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious if there has been, you've seen innovation in this in the industry, like there's a large monoculture mm -hmm. crop farms. Mm -hmm. So the it it really depends on the person, like the, the farmer themselves, and um, so Frog Hollow Farm is one of the it was the biggest farm that we worked on, and um, it's an organic farm, and Farmer Al is quite liberal and um, has always cared about conservation, kind of from the beginning that he when he uh, created this farm, but. Um, and he's all for it. The problem with 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 that farm is that he's, he's so busy because his farm is so so large. Um, Wolf Farm, on the other hand, is completely open. It is a smaller farm. Um, they are conventional. They agree with our practices. They like bees, but Farmer Al is always just saying how he needs to spray the herbicide to get rid of the the weeds um, because he thinks that's more sufficient. And that's what he grew up learning. His father passed his farm down onto him. And, and many farmers have a um, ingrained mindset that's very hard to shape based certain habits. Um, so really I've seen it, it differs farm to farm and um, connecting with farmers is one of the most important components um, and outreach is super important. But I've really only worked on these eight farms in Brentwood and um, yeah, I would love to see, I haven't uh, worked on the Ventura farms, but from what I hear, they're very, Accommodating to the lab and really willing to, to have this work. Um, yeah, I, I think I think it's important, and I think outreach is one of the main ways to convey the significance. <laughs> uh, there are pictures all around. There's little flyers. You're welcome to take these these papers. Um, kind of a a summary of what I just went over, and yeah, take a look at the images. They're taken by our bee photographer, Roland Coville, um, who is a retired entomologist, but still involved in the lab, and likes to take pictures of bees for, for fun and inspection, and they're beautiful. <laughs> Thank you, Ingrid. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.